Good evening, Frank. While the people are settling into their seats, could I ask you to explain what the talk tonight is about? We start off. You're not going to get Simon. No, you're not going to get. We start off with who uh, the Jews were. They were slaves who left Egypt about 1000 BC. They followed a man named Moses to Israel. He didn't live to get to Israel, but they set themselves up in Israel as a new nation of Jews. And it was from them that Jesus was born and he was the son of a carpenter and the extraordinary about him until he was about 30 years of age and then he started going out and preaching in an 80 mile radius. He was executed by the Jewish authorities and his followers believed that he was the Messiah who was to come and rescue them and that he came to set up a new religion. Uh, they spread out throughout the world preaching. The person with the biggest influence was Paul, who wasn't an apostle, but a convert. And he was converted to Christ's teaching, and he was the one who set off and started to convert non-Jewish people. And he came back to Antioch. And when he got back, to was pandemonium. Because he, on the way, had been converting and baptizing people who weren't Jews. Now, those, many of those who believed in the man believed he was a Jew and stayed a Jew, and that he was the Messiah, and he was the Jewish Messiah. And they didn't at that point believe that he had actually left Judaism and started another religion. So that was the first get attention there. So, when back and announced this, there was war. And they had a meeting in Jerusalem, which had become known as the First Council, the Council of Jerusalem. And there was a big row. And the row was between James, who maintained that they were Jews. And they were Jews who believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And Paul, who came to start a new uh, organization, and that everyone was left. The interesting thing about the Council of Jerusalem, and it has an impact now, is that Peter initially took James aside and condemned Paul. But Paul and Peter, the Pope, <laughs> they didn't call him Pope then, he was leader. Paul took him on. And he won. Peter changed his mind. And in the Acts, the, the apostles, Peter says, the truth of country lies that God favorite anybody of any nationality is acceptable to him. God sends his word to the people of Israel, and it was to them that the good news was brought, but Jesus is the Lord of all. That was a huge shift. And it led to the first split, because James didn't do it. And there was a group set up who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but believed he was Jewish and stayed Jewish, and that he was the one sent to rescue them. And they called themselves Ebionites. Ebionites. And they were under James. It didn't last very long because James was one of the first to be executed on the first time novelist, you know, it, it hadn't developed enough. But there were a group in Jerusalem who did not believe that he had started a religion. Now here's the second reference to the existence, the historical existence of Jesus. Flavius Josephus in his history uh, speaks then about the execution of James. There were a group among the traditional Jews, didn't believe, even Christianity aside, didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they weren't going to have that within the Jewish religion. So they put their sides in, because he had accused of being lawbreakers, and they had James stoned. 
But the inter two interesting things they're referring to is the blood of Jesus. Leave that aside whether people accept that or not. He was a man of enormous significance. But his execution finished this other ring that was going to be a subsection of the Jews. So now Paul has an open field and he's off again. What nationality was it Paul? Paul, um, he, he, he was a Roman citizen, he wasn't Roman. I think he was Turkish. Turkish. Oh, well, he always ignorant <laughs> for Jews. No, he me. I well, always thought honest, he then. was Jewish, and this is, he yeah, was he a was Pharisee, and yeah. this is why yeah. he persecuted, <laughs> he was right. so convinced that yeah. this Well, I have to right, but it's a nationality. I, I, I don't think he's yeah. Palestinian. Yeah. I have it there. Yeah, but the Jews had said oh, no. all around that's that. Because she's asked me his nationality. Yeah. I think, I think <coughs> maybe because he's there and all that books somewhere. Um, but I have to remember. Him. But the, you're, you're correct. He, he, he was Jewish, but of the extreme wing, and he persecuted the Christians. And he was also a Roman citizen, which means it would indicate he wasn't Palestinian. No, he was Roman. But this becomes very important later. The fact that he's a Roman citizen becomes very, very important. I look it up for you. Uh, but he was Jewish, and he was trained uh, as a priest for the better word, and he was very, very anti-Christian, uh, and he was a Roman citizen. And that's that's about Tarsus. Um, you see, the Jews belong, believe that it's a nation, it isn't just yeah. a religion. Yeah. So it's rather like Irish living abroad. He yeah. was part of the diaspora, of the diaspora yeah. that may have lived yeah. in Turkey. But the fact that he was Jewish. Roman becomes critical. No more than De Valera claimed to be American. Yeah. It's in the same way. They were on with the chips. They were on with the down. Now, all he goes again. And now he's converting Godo, and he's no more problem with the, the group in Jerusalem because they have been sorted, as the fellow says. And he's off again on the tour journey. And I mean, when you think of the time that we're in it, like this was absolutely extraordinary. Now, we come uh, uh, later on to the books of the New Testament. The earliest writings, then, of course, are Paul, because he was writing as he was going around, and he was sending back letters to the bottom, keep him on the straight and narrow, and so on. Now, he was in Caesarea, okay? And uh, the Jewish uh, uh, authorities, one of the better one, had him arrested, and just as he was about to go to trial, he announced that he was a Roman citizen, and they couldn't try him. He could only be tried in Rome. So, he was sent to Rome to be tried. So he played his trump card at that stage. Uh, shipwrecked along the way, and then went down to Rome. Um, there he is, I got that picture of him making his enrollment in prison. And he was released. And he's off again. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. But he was arrested then the second time. And he didn't get away this time. And he was martyred around 67, 68. Uh, and Peter, who had gone to minister to the Christian community in Rome, he was also martyred out there within a year or two. Within a year or two of each other. In the mid-60s, the two of them are martyred. Now <coughs> we come to the books of the New Testament. Now, Paul's letters were already out <coughs> about. He had sent out his letters, and people were copying them, and so on. But nothing had been done about the story of Jesus, the actual story of, of Jesus. There's Paul's letters, and they're just divided up. Um, I'll come back to the story. So, the mid-60s, they're executed. Uh, so now James is gone. Paul is gone, and Peter is gone. The Jews rose around 68 AD, and the, the, the Romans destroyed them uh, 70 AD, and they made their last stand, which is still there, and they were completely surrounded by the Romans, and rather than surrender, 600 of them committed suicide in the south. 
The Wailing Wall in, in Jerusalem is all that's left of the Temple because the Romans were the destruction of the Temple. So now the Jews, as um, a distinct country, are gone until the creation of modern Israel. So they were gone. Now let's go back. Uh, after the death of Paul and Peter and James, this in essence was the size of Christianity. Here's where the Christian communities were. Almost all Jew to Paul. Why didn't they write the books then? Well, my own belief is, if you read Paul's letters, because Paul was the one who was writing the contemporaneous today, and you read the Acts of the Apostles, they definitely believed that the second coming was going to be in their lifetime. They believed he was going to come back within their lifetime. And their whole emphasis was on converting people. So why would you be writing books? Because books in those days, it wasn't like now, you couldn't go and get a real paper. You know, to make the papyrus was an enormous job. And very few people were educated to write books and so on. And then when Paul and Peter and Jesus are executed, and others, Andrew, so it turns on them. These people are dying. The people who knew them are gone. Somebody better start writing this down. You know what I mean? Somebody better start uh, writing this down. Now in those days it was very hard to write things down. And there's papyrus there. You see that plant there? But you have to interweave that. See that? And then you have to steam it. You have to press it. And so on. And writing on that was very difficult. And you need to describe a scholarly person to do it. So writing in those days was not an easy business. So all kinds of people started writing all kinds of things about it. So there was stuff everywhere about it. And <coughs> they were beginning to pull themselves together as a distinct kind of organization. And there was this very, very studious guy, Irenaeus. And he, would, he lived between... AD 115, AD 202. He was asked, like a tribunal today, you know, have a look at the whole thing, come up with, with a book. And this is what he came up with. And he read, he read loads of stuff. And he said, you could stand over these. You could stand over these. Now, these four here, they were just four accounts of Jesus' life. It was Irenaeus who attributed them to Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. That's where that came from. From his studies, from his talking to people, he attributed those to Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. And he said he could stand over all these. Now, the ones we have today, these are not included. These came later as one of the accounts. Irenaeus was the first one to say, look, these are solid. Okay. So he said that these four, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, were reliable accounts of Jesus' life. Now there were a lot more accounts, but he, he moved them aside. He said no. The this thing about Mark, <coughs> scholars are agreed now, Mark's is the shortest, and scholars are agreed that Mark's is the earliest. Now how do we know that? Well, you can, you can move John to one side, because John's is totally different than written later in life, and we know that that was written after the destruction of the temple, so you move that aside. So now you're down to um, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Luke says in his Gospel uh, that he's coming in days, he didn't know the man, he's only writing from what he heard. So now you're down to Matthew and Mark. <clears throat> Mark was not an apostle. And Marx is the shortest. And 95% of what Marx says is repeated again in Matthew and about another 30% on top of that again. So if you could envisage this, Mark was the companion of Peter. Mark went everywhere with Peter. And this man here, Papias, of Hierapolis, who knew Mark, he was asked to explain why Mark had lost it. He said he wrote down accurately wherever he remembered. 
It was not, however, an exact order that he related, but he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. He didn't know. But afterwards he accompanied Peter. So he got involved from Peter. Now the interesting thing about Mark is the chronology is not great. He doesn't mention anything about the birth of Jesus or the earlier because he didn't know about it. And you can imagine someone, listen Mark, you knew Peter. Would you ever remember what Peter was saying? And you can imagine yourself now that, oh yeah, one day he thought, and another day he did that. Oh and yeah, he, he did that. And it's not necessarily in chronological order. And he related just like telling a story. So Mark is just telling the story as he got it from Peter. But he didn't know Jesus. <coughs> Matthew, who did know Jesus, you can envisage Matthew saying, looking at this and saying, oh yeah, that's right, yeah. but there's more. And 95% of Mark is repeated again in Matthew in different chronological order. Remember, Matthew said, I hadn't got it fully right out. That, that, that. You know? And he deals with the birth of Jesus. And he deals with the crucifixion and the ascension and so on. Now, the chances of that being written the other way around are virtually nil. In other words, if you wrote a whole thing and another fellow said, I'm going to take a bit of that and change it all around. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense the other way. Now, then you have, that's Matthew, and it, it's known he was, in, now we have Luke. Now Luke tells us at the start of his gospel that many have undertaken to set an orderly account of the events uh, that were handed down to us, so he didn't know the man either, who were eyewitnesses to the word, because they're telling the story. They're relating what happened or what they heard happened. Now, Irenaeus said, these three you can rely on. Now, there's loads of other ones, but he, 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 he didn't rely on them. Uh, John is totally different. John was the youngest of the apostles. John is said to have lived to a great age. And late in life, he started to write. But he didn't tell the story. He wanted to interpret who he thought Jesus was. He related to the stories. He says he did this to show that. He did that to put the other. Do you know what I mean? And he is explaining. And also his language. In the beginning was the word, and the words were, he's in a totally different world altogether. So he really has nothing to add to the actual story, but he starts to interpret. So he's the first theologian, really. He says the meaning of this, and he said that because, and he did this to show them that. The others don't get into that hardly at all. They tell the story. So there, if you like, the four Gospels. Now, what did early Christian gatherings consist of? We used to read accounts of Jesus' life from the various letters written by apostles. They used to then discuss it. Now, later that evolved into sermons. One guy got up and told you the way it was. In the early days, there was discussions. And there was, what did it mean? All the rest of it. And then they partook of the bread and wine in the language of Jesus. And that's essentially what they did. And they did that in their houses, and they did it in various places. Now, the whole thing of temples and all that, this all came from Rome. You know what I mean? That they can have temples, we can have temples. You know, and, and, uh, but the man himself never put a brick upon a brick, and never collected a penny. So, the important thing was what they did. Now, this guy was a big problem. Fortunately, Irenaeus worked before this guy. The emperor Diocletian, he just hated him. So he ordered that all their scriptures be born by fire. Everything be born by fire. And made a pretty good job of it. Of course, this was an awful uh, tragedy. Uh, fortunately, he was followed 
by Constantine. Now I told you that the spread of Christianity hinged on two people, Paul. Paul is the one, and Constantine. Constantine converted to Christianity. They say mainly his mother. The mother converted, and that man was out there. And in those days, if the boss said, kick with the left foot, and you wanted advancement, you kicked with the left foot. You know how the, the Spanish lisp come about. That Spaniards in Spain have a lisp, but uh, uh, people who speak Spanish in South America don't have a lisp. And that's because Romans of Spain developed the lisp. And rather than mock them, they all developed the lisp. <laughs> So this man then had an enormous effect, and not only did he convert to Christianity, but he declared Christianity to be the religion of the empire. And this was the big, big love. This was big time. Yeah. And because he was the emperor, they adopted a whole load of things that really come from the Roman Empire. A lot of the, the vestments, uh, their configuration of church design and so on, they all back to a secular kind of origin. Now, Irenaeus had said his bit, but it didn't carry any weight except that that's what he said. This man, Pope Damasus, he decided there's so much stuff floating around that we're going to agree on, on what consists of the Bible, and we're going to translate into Latin. And he commissioned this man, St. Jerome, to do it. And it took him 15 years to do it. Now, the Council of Carthage 397, that pronounced on the canonical scriptures, and that declared the situation that we have today. The Council of Carthage said that the canonical scriptures are the bum, 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 bum. Okay. And you just go back a bit, that's what Jerome translated into Latin, and that's what became known as the Latin Vulgate, and that was the position in Latin down to the Second Vatican. That was the official. Now, there's the Vulgate there in written form, and then it was translated down, and that's what the priest read from at Mass when you went to the child to Mass and you read it out on the altar and that's uh, Incidentally, the, the Celtic scriptures, like the Book of Kells, <coughs> they're all the Vulgate. Vulgate. So, look at the comparative lens. I told you Mark's the shortest. John is out and thrown a bit there. Matthew, you see, added on about nearly half again, Andre, and then Luke. <laughs> These are all Paul's uh, letters down here. Um, and then James and Peter and so on. Now one here, for years and years and years, the Hebrews was attributed to Paul. It's now generally agreed by scholars that whoever wrote it, it wasn't Paul. Because Paul took the stand at the Council of Jerusalem and took on James and so on, he, he was not liked by them. And he didn't go back at and they were the Hebrews. And the last fella they were going to take any instruction from was Paul. <laughs> and when you read it, it's different. So whoever wrote it, it's almost certain it wasn't Paul. Because they wouldn't have taken it from it. Like all organizations, you, get, you have it today. And there's more Apocrypha <coughs> than there is New Testament. You know what I mean? no, and they're all contemporaneous and they're all written at the time, nobody disputes that, but they're not recognized as um, sound. But you can go and write them, you can read them, whatever. And um, scholars still do look at them, but they have been rejected and they're not acknowledged uh, as being, if you like, dependent. Who so they rejected them? Huh? Well, you go back, Irenaeus, Irenaeus first, he, he was, Irenaeus was a scholar, remember the guy I told you about, he came up with this list, 
Then the Council of Carthage, using Irenaeus and stuff and looking at whatever, they made the decision. Why? Ah? Why? We don't have enough time to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to go and read this. But see, is it not that they say, the canon, yeah. that this is the essential? Essentials are in this. The rest is nice background reading, but we, if, this is what you're to believe, so to speak. We could have a special weekend with it all. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a whole, amongst scholars, it's a huge area. From the point of view of Catholics, that's it. Um, and, uh, but they all didn't agree to say it. For example, um, the, there's 24 books in the Jewish Bible. That they, they don't have the New Testament. The the there's 73 in the Catholic, there's 78 in the Orthodox, and there's 66 in the Protestants. Just to be different. So, so. But that's a whole, you can devote your whole life back to that. So you, you come at the end to what you believe or what you don't believe. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're all there. And there are people that have bought, you can go into the shops and buy the apartment and read them all there. But, you know, now the next, well, I just, if you like to get through 2,000 years of history, <laughs> I can only give you the flavor here. Now. So now we have, it's agreed by what was then, then, the church. This is long before Protestant churches never did. What was then, the church. The next move, now that was all written. I showed you one earlier. They're written... There's no sentences, there's no paragraphs, the area, just what paper was sketched, you know, can't just kind of write, no full stop. <laughs> Impossible to read, you see? So this man, Stephen Langton, in 1150 to 1228, he was the first person to divide the Bible into defined chapters. Now we're still talking about the Latin Bible. So he divided it into eight chapters. Now this one here was very bold. Because Rome had decreed that it was to be in Latin, full stop. But there were people who said, you people don't understand that. You know what I mean? And, and uh, right up until my time as a child, when the priest stood up at Mass, he read Latin. Now, John Wycliffe, now, this is 1324, long before the Reformation or anything like that. John Wycliffe hit off and translated the Vulgate Bible, the approved Bible, into English. And he was an Oxford scholar. And now you see, there's the way, uh, you see the way they're, they're written, there's very hard to read. So, but Wycliffe uh, used Langdon's chapter divisions. See the chapter divisions there? He divided it up. Um, now, we're still long before printing or anything else. Mm. And he translated into English, and Rome went absolutely pronounced. <laughs> absolutely pronounced. And condemned it outright. Uh, there was, a, a, I don't know whether it was a synod or whatever, uh, at which Wycliffe, now communication does sound very difficult, like it took ages for word to spread back and forth. Anyway, he was declared a heretic, and uh, we just go back a bit. Uh, lucky for him, by the time he was declared a heretic, he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> but the Pope, I have there who he was, I can look it up for you. There's only so much in carry me. Anyway, the Pope at the time wasn't having any of that. So he said he was to be exhumed and burned at the stake <laughs> and his ashes spread in the river, which they did. And that was John Wycliffe. The message there was, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, so, poor old Wycliffe. Yeah. Although, there's still, written, by, written in hand now, long before the printing press, there's still 200 of Wycliffe's uh, Bibles still extant in museums and so on. So, do you know how many were there? Right. So, people wanted to be able to, to read it. So. The next big thing to cause a problem for the fundamentalists and the those uh, who are in control and so on was the printing press. <coughs> it was just like laptops and computers. <laughs> it was, you know what I mean? They're gone into a whole new era with the printing press. 
And uh, now yeah, the printing press came along in 1440. Shortly after that was Martin Luther. He had his big long list. And to quote um, our Minister for Justice, he didn't get everything right. <laughs> <laughs> but nowadays we think he might have got some of it right. You know what I mean? But he, he was, you know, you see, it was, you're either all right or all wrong. And he was all wrong. But now we're doing a lot of things that he was doing. You know, as I think. But there were other things which he, But he felt that the Bible should be in the language of the masses and he said bugger them and he went off and he translated the Bible into um, German and he printed it. The Lutheran Bible. He printed it. The next man on the scene was William Tyndale, an English scholar. So we only have a Bible now in Germany. William Tyndale, he got word of Luther, and he said, well, if he can translate it into German, I can translate it into English. And whereas Wycliffe had translated the Vulgate, Tyndale went right back to the Greek and the Hebrew. And he translated directly from the Greek and the Hebrew because he said he didn't trust them. He translated it that. And he had the first Bible to be printed in English, William Tyndall. Now he wasn't as lucky as, as Wycliffe, and there's one of his Bibles there. Now it's not English as we know. And you read that like a modern language, you know? Mm -hmm. Not English as we know. And uh, that, Henry VIII went through a few <coughs> phases. He was trying to win favour with Rome over his divorce and so on. So he went to a phase where he was trying to win favour. And then when Rome wouldn't bend, he said, ah, oh, But in the time when he was trying to win favour, Rome was trying to get a hold of Tyndale. And Henry invited Tyndale to a meeting. And Tyndale along, and Henry arrested him and had him burned at the stake to get favour with Rome. And when he was born, Tyndale said, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. <coughs> Now, when you see what happens later, you smile at that. I love morning and stay home. So another thing now happens. I've got, we have the, the we have it in various languages now, and we have the chapters broken up. This guy Robert Estienne Stephanus was a printer, and he now in those days you see they were all very religious and people Bible and so on. He was a read bloody thing and so on, and he had a long journey from France to Italy figured out how to think of verses. Now, you think you did better things to think about. I don't know. But by the time you got to the end of the journey, he figured out the verses. Okay? And Protestants had broken the various sects now, so you had Calvin. Calvin was the first man to print a Bible with the verses in it. See it there? The Geneva Bible. And he was the first person to print a commentary on the side, an explanation on the side. Now, before I get into King James Bible, I just go back to um, poor old uh, uh, Tyndale. Tyndale was born to the state by Henry VIII to gain favour with, with Rome. But then Henry VIII falls out of Rome. And uh, he starts his own church. And one of the things that he says he'll have is that an English Bible? Just a, yeah. And whose Bible does he print? The fellow he born to Tyndale. So in for a few more years, the clock comes around. So poor old Tyndale ended up. So now you James the First, and James the First, he didn't like um, Henry VIII's Bible, Tyndale's Bible, and so on. So he gather together a group of scholars who would produce a Bible by his instructions in the finest English, the King James Bible, which today in terms of the poeticism of the words is beautiful, it's still beautiful. Now leave aside the accuracy of the translation or anything else. If you wanted to read the Bible, 
The King James Bible is like poetry. <laughs> and it is the one still used by the Church of Ireland, the, the Anglican Church, the King James Bible, the Ducks and the Dow and all this. And that was uh, James uh, the Horse, the King James Bible. But not any longer. I'll be here. I'll come to that later. Yeah. Well, not totally, <laughs> still in all spots. I'll cross this you know. I'll come to that later. Finally, finally, the Catholic Church gets the message. If you can't beat them, you'll have to join them. <laughs> but it'll have to be an approved one. So they get a load of scholars. And they come out with the Douay Reims Bible. Because half of it was done in Douay and the rest of it was done in Reims. <laughs> and that became the English Bible for Catholics right down to the Second Vatican Council. But the liturgy remained in Latin. The mass and the liturgy remained in Latin. So it was only educated, the thinking there was only educated people who would go outside the pulpit. I mean, they certainly weren't going to get it from the pulpit. Uh, and, and that lasted down to the Second Vatican. And we're right up now to the Second Vatican Council. And finally, the color is introduced into Catholic liturgy. All kinds of Bibles come out in different countries. A little aside, <clears throat> the earliest Irish Bible is 1680, Church of Ireland, uh, by Bedell and O'Daniel. And that's it there. There was no Bible in Irish until 1981 on Tahar Parik of Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> now, we're back now to your point there now. So the, the Anglican Church is using the, um, the King James Bible. The Catholic Church has various different ones, Jerusalem Bible and so on, so whatever you have in yourself all around. You go from one extreme to the other. So in fairness now, to Archbishop Martin and the uh, Church of Ireland people, because they were looking forward, they were beginning to come out with other stuff themselves and so on. And they said, why don't we have a shot at finally getting an agreed version, something we can all and the first agreed version between the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church of a part of the New Testament in English anywhere in the world is that. Done. Everyone got a copy of that in the Catholic Church. And there are scholars between the two churches working. You know the time you talk to but you have to get over all these things. Mm -hmm. That Church of Ireland and Church of Catholic Church. Ireland and the Catholic Church in the, in the Dublin Diocese. Yes, yeah, so I've been working. Met with some I've been here. working. And the first output from that group. And that's agreed for both. Now, you wonder why all these things take so long. But you, you have Michael D. Higgins standing up in London today. Why is it taking so long? Mm -hmm. And still, there would still be people who don't agree with And on the religious side, there will still be people who don't agree with And there are still, certainly, Anglican people who will read the King James Bible till the day they die. Because that's what they were brought up on, and that's what they know. I see chaps that I know going down to daily mass, and they have their big, thick missile yes, there, yes, yeah. going back mm -hmm. to another one, leave it. Leave it. It'll all change. And, but it's not marvellous, like, after all. Mm -hmm. uh, right. We'll, um... Right. What have we got left in terms of the old stuff? Remember the Ecclesian born Bosnia? There is the oldest gospel fragment in the world. And it's in the Ryland collection in Manchester. Now, it's the oldest gospel fragment. And it's a bit of the Gospel of St. John, and it's dated to 128. And that's the oldest. 
But the oldest New Testament texts, not Gospel Testament texts in the world, are in Dublin. And the more than most Dubliners never went up Nelson's Pillar. Mm. And you tell them this in Dublin and they haven't got any clue. And there's people going from all over the world. And that's the test of the United States. And they are the letters of St. Paul. And the oldest letters of St. Paul in the world are in Dublin. Now he does have extracts also from the, the Gospels and the Acts and so on. He uh, was um, English, he was a billionaire, he uh, spent his whole life, he, he made his money on diamond in, in Canada, he spent his whole life collecting ancient books, uh, oriental books, um, and he's noted for his oriental stuff, but also Christian. If you go into the Chester Beatty Library, which is free, there's a very nice film of him there, and uh, she interviews him there, uh, and she said, uh, was it difficult to get them? And he said, well, back when he got them in the 20s and 30s, there were these Arab young sheikhs who were just emerging from living in tents. And they had this stuff and they didn't know what it was. And he had agents all over the world who'd spot stuff. And she says to him, um, well, would it cost much? And he said, well, there was very little that a Cadillac or two wouldn't buy. <laughs> Getting all this. So then he fell out with the British government and he, uh, they wanted to tax him up to the hills and he couldn't agree on all this stuff and tax it. So he moved the whole lot to Dublin and he set up an Aylesbury Road and he built his own museum and he became an Irish citizen and he was the first non-native to get a state museum because he left a collection that was absolutely priceless. Mm. Only scholars went to Aylesbury Road, so the government spent a lot of money on building a custom built library in Dublin Castle. Mm. Build the Dublin Castle and you can see that stuff uh, there. There is stuff, he has letters, Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, all the letters, he's stuff from the, um, the oldest text in Paul's epistles in the world, 175 AD. And you cannot but be struck when you go in and look at them. Now the next big collector was Martin Bosmer. He has an almost complete Gospel of St. John, 200 AD. And this particular fragment he has here from Luke includes the oldest text in the world of the Lord's Prayer, 220 AD. And that's the Bosmer uh, uh, collection. It's in the United States. So that's, so where do we get all this New Testament and books and all that from the reading? The oldest complete New Testaments. There's three of them. And the first is the Codex Vaticanus. Now the first thing to say is that everything we have is in Greek or in a few instances in Hebrew. The man himself spoke Aramaic. We don't have a single sentence in Aramaic. Earliest is Greek or Hebrew. So right from the beginning it's translation. Translation is very tricky. And there was a big row when uh, they started translating the Bible and Jerome was trans translating the Bible. There was a row between him and Augustine of Hitler. Because Jerome said the only way you could do it sensibly was sense for sense. In other words, you look at a sense and say, what does that mean in this language? Whereas Augustine of Hippo, who wasn't the linguist, said it had to be word for word. If you do it word for word, you get gobbledygook. Like, do you know uh, where Obama says, yes, we can? I'm not an Irish scholar, but because of the difference in the construction of the two languages, you cannot say, yes, we are Irish. And what they say is, it's made of but that means we are able. Now, in a sense, it's the same thing. But you cannot say, yes, we can engage. So people who talk about hanging on every word, to me, they don't know what to talk about. They're not linguists. Yes? Yes, yes, we are able. Yes, we can. 
We are able. Say we can. Chef, it's yes. The spadling is we are able. It's spadling. We are able. It's also we can. No. It's a matter of interpretation. It's not literally. It's not really for words. You follow what I mean? You've got a, you've got a bigger number of words. So it cannot be a, a word for word translation. Because there's more words in one than there is in the other. Are you with me? Oh, I've had people go all around the block. You would have to end up with the exact number of words saying the same thing and a capital. And the same applies to all other languages. So it's dangerous territory. It's sense for sense. What does it mean? What's it mean? Now, the Codex Vaticanus was written. They can do this by testing some of the, the, the development of papyrus. You know, they, they carbon dated. So that's around 330 AD. Uh, that and the other two I'm going to all came from the periphery of Christendom, out around Egypt and Alexandria, where Diocletian didn't get it. Do you follow me? And that uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Constantinople, many years, and it found its way to the Vatican, and it's in the Vatican Library since about the year 1400. And I'm not fully sure where it was from, and it's in Greek. The other one, which is very interesting, is St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And that's the Codus Sinaiticus. And that monastery, which is still there, and which you can only get into by being pulled up in a basket and put into it. <laughs> and the world passed them by, and it's so dry there. And they have God knows what there. But this guy, Tischendorf, was staying there. And, uh, the monks put him up and were surrounded with all this stuff and he was a biblical scholar. And he went into a room with some of these parchments and so on. And he started picking up bits and so on. And he said, God, this is the Bible. Mm -hmm. And over a number of months he put the whole thing together. And uh, that became known as the Codus Sinaiticus. Now listen to this for a story. He put it all together. He was Russian. And he told the monks that uh, what it was, you know, this, this was a very, very early Bible. And he asked for permission to, to show it to the Tsar of Russia. So they gave him permission to show the Tsar of Russia. But the Tsar of Russia liked it so much, he never sent it back. <laughs> and the monks in St. Catherine's, and they're even more cagey with letting people in now, they have a thing on the wall which is a letter from Tischendorf guaranteeing that the book will be brought back. So that stayed in the, the library belonging to the Tsar in Russia. And uh, in 1933, Stalin had a kind of a, an attic saying, you know, break a bank. <laughs> and he sold, he, sold, Garage Garage he sold it to the British Museum for Hong Kong. So it's in the British Museum. Uh, what about the two Scottish sisters? Yeah, they, they, they yeah. had there too then. Yeah. They, 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 they were the ones who got Tischendorf in. They, they, yeah. they collected far more than The same thing. Yeah. It's the Codex yeah. 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 and yeah. a lot of other stuff. Mainly there. Yeah, but I just yeah. put it down in the sense that it was Tischendorf who finally identified. Oh, those two, those two women, uh, I think uh, I, I loaned the book to someone here today, and I get to someone, yeah, John McAvoy. There's a book. Yeah. on them. And they did yeah. discover a lot. Yeah. And it was they who yeah. cottoned down to this monastery and they were sidekicks of Tischendorf. The third one, and we're going to the Codex Alexandrinus, that came from Alexandria and uh, it found its way ultimately to uh, Constantinople and it too also found its way into the British Library. So there are the three that have the whole New Testament, and it's from them that everything else flows. I'm told my time is up. I thought it was a big week. Be here for another week. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Switch them all back on. Um, the donation box at the back of the hall. Uh, as you know, we uh, boy of our the society exists on voluntary contributions. So uh, uh, we never refuse anybody there putting anything in the box to make the hole. Well, now Jesus has never done the creation. <laughs> 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 <laughs>